um, around these more dangerous drugs aren't actually working in terms of preventing deaths and disabilities and brain death. And so my one pitch to our MP here is to expedite passage of Bill C-37, which was recently tabled in the House of Parliament. So that's all I'm going to say about the, um, the context in which the public health voice, which was represented on this committee, that's the context of where we came from. How can we regulate a psychoactive substance to minimize the harms, whether they're social harms, economic harms, or health-based harms? And so the, 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 pre, the present government formed a, a, a task force. I was privileged to be a member on it. It was chaired by the Honorable Adam McClellan, who would be both the Minister of Public Safety and the Minister of Health. It was co-chaired, the vice chair was Dr. Mark Ware, who's a physician researcher professor out of Montreal, who's had expertise in pain management, also leads the Canadian uh, Cannabis Research Network. There was um, an ex-RCMP superintendent, Ray Sukar. There's a current superintendent from law enforcement from the eastern provinces. Uh, BC was well represented. Um, George Chow, an ex-city councillor, was on it, as was Professor Susan Boyd, who's got a 25-year history of analysing drug policy at the University of Victoria. And also, we had Professor Von Tiederstrom from Saskatchewan, whose legal background was in anal analysing drug policy and law. And who am I missing? And I'm missing Kat Dr. Catherine Zahn, who's the CEO of the Canadian, uh, of the CAMH, the, the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health in Ontario. And we were formed in July and we were given uh, the mandate of making recommendations to the federal government uh, by the end of November. We, there was also an online um, questionnaire that people could uh, respond to and people were invited and organizations were invited to submit um, their input. And about 28,000, nearly 29,000 Canadians responded to the online questionnaire. There are about 1,500 submissions um, from individuals and several hundred submissions from professional organizations and other groups. We also traveled across the country and had meetings with um, expert groups, with citizen groups, with municipalities, and with uh, federal, provincial, well, and with provincial and territorial elected officials, and we made uh, site visits to Washington and to Colorado, and we held teleconferences with officials from Uruguay, which is currently the only country that has uh, legalized cannabis. So that was the process that we went through. We personally did not analyze the 28,000 uh, responses. That was done by Hill and Knowlton, who did an excellent job, and I would really recommend, if you want to get further into this, downloading the report, which has a synopsis of all of that work in it. I'm going to give just an overview of our responses to some of the key questions that were asked of us by uh, the federal government, which was that we were asked to be very specific in our responses about how to minimize harms of use, how to establish a safe and responsible production system, how to design an appropriate uh, distribution system, how to enforce public safety and uh, protection, and how to ac access marijuana for medical purposes. And one of the first things we did was try and get more scientific about this and change the title from marijuana to cannabis. So we have put a report on regulating cannabis because that is the scientific name of the plant from which the various derivatives come. And people are concerned about cannabis. It has a, over a hundred cannabinoids within it. Probably the one that you're most familiar with is tetra hydro, delta 9 THC tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the one with the psychoactive properties. But there's also a range of other products uh, like CBD, cannabidiol, and that is the one that has, I think, a lot of promise in terms of medical usage because our body has a, what's called an endocannabinoid system with receptors for cannabinoids in the brain, in the lymphatic system, in the immune system, throughout the body. And the potential medical uses of it, I think, uh, 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 very impressive, potentially. Looking at this 
demographic, I would think that you are probably more interested in the medical uses than the recreational uses. But that, that's just a guess. You don't know point As I say, that's just a guess. So, anyway, just touching on some of the key points. Um, in terms of minimizing harms of use, one of the key recommendations we've made is should there be a minimum age for legal purchase? And um, as you'll probably be aware, the, the current, if you look at who's using the most currently, it's the demographic 19 to 30. Um, and we know that kids start using, about two thirds of the kids start using before the age of 15. And there is concern, as you know, about the impact of early use on the brain, on the developing brain, and association with schizophrenia and psychosis. I think the most danger comes from kids who use early and who use frequently, as with any intoxicant. Um, but our key recommendation is how do we minimize use at an age which is clearly dangerous? Uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society suggested that the age should be 25. The medical associations say the age should be 25. Because clearly the executive functions of the brain don't really get totally finalized until age 25. Had we, however, made that um, recommendation, I mean, what we want to do here, one of the backgrounds, is can we create a legal framework for marijuana which will compete with the black market <coughs> and remove the black market, but we'll have to compete with it in terms of quality, better quality, access, safer access, and price. And so if you set an age limit of 25, you automatically have a very large number of people who are currently accessing it. And I think that would have created not only a lot of scoff laws and potential criminals, but also an ongoing market for the black market to sell to. So we rather pragmatically looked at the ages at which provinces and territories regulate access to cannabis and tobacco, which from a societal perspective, probably at current levels of use cause more harm than, than cannabis does. And, and so we recommend that setting the age at 18 would be a pragmatic level at which you could set it, which would not, in, it not push too many people into the legal system, but would try and minimize use at the youthful age where it is dangerous. And I think that some provinces and territories may wish to move that up to be consistent with their age at which tobacco and cannabis can be used. Um, only three provinces have an age of, of alcohol access for 18, most of them have 90. So we'll see how that one plays out. This was a pragmatic, probably not the best evidence-based way to go, but it was a pragmatic way of setting an age. We also wanted to have look at the issue of advertising and market restrict and restricting marketing because we don't want to see rampant use of, 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 of cannabis. We didn't want to put it into a market economy. So we looked at alcohol and tobacco and felt that cannabis should be treated more like tobacco when it comes to promotions and advertising. So we're recommending restrictions around that. We also looked at taxation and pricing and you have competing interests there. One, you want to compete with the black market because obviously if, if pricing is higher than the black market, people will go to the black market, but you don't want to put pricing so low that it encourages um, I increased consumption from, from present levels. So we're recommending that research be done into an appropriate pricing mechanism that will be competitive with the, with the black market but won't at the same time be encouraging um, increased uh, consumption. We also recommended that in terms of taxation, that should be used to try and drive people who are going to use cannabis towards lower potency products. So it's good in, in alcohol, it's volumetric pricing. You tax on the amount of alcohol in, a, in an ounce of the liquid rather than on the volumes. So we would recommend a taxing uh, regime that taxed 95% THC products higher than 20% uh, THC products, for example, to try and you know to try and direct consumption towards a lower a lower potency product. We also uh, recommended against trying to legislate potency. 
we heard from a lot of the folk, particularly in, on the medical side, that higher potency products are actually necessary for them to use. So we thought if we tried to restrict high potency products, again, we'd be opening up a, a door in the market, for the black market. We might also encourage people to try and make their own high potency products, which can be very dangerous when you're doing butane extraction uh, from the raw products to try and make hash oils or concentrates or a substance which is on the market called chatter, which is extraordinarily high potency and can be manufactured dangerously. Uh, and we've seen that happen. We also um, wanted to talk about what should, what range of products should be available. If you go down to Washington State and you go into one of the cannabis dispensaries, you'd be amazed at the, at the range of products you can find. Everything from lollipops to tomato ketchup, which is infused uh, with THC. We, yeah, it's true actually, honeys, vinegars, you name it, almost everything, including lollipops and gummy bears. And in fact, in Washington State, they had to pass restrictions on what you could actually produce because kids were getting into gummy bears and lollipops. And so we're recommending a very strict limit on the form of products that can be produced. Nothing that is appealing to children. And, and we would recommend restricting access to things like making things that look like normal food or drink products. And we recommend plain packaging with really clear information about the content of what's in it, limiting the dosage uh, and the number of doses to a particular product so that if you bought, say, a brownie square, you would know how many doses that was and no dose would be more than 10 milligrams and you'd have some consistency and quality in that product. We also had long discussions about personal possession. How much should people be able to carry? All of the United States, all of the states in the US which have legalized it for medical use or for recreational use have recommended a limit of about 30 grams, which is about an ounce of leaf or equivalent uh, uh, product. We had a big discussions around what that should be, and we decided that we would recommend a limit of 30 grams, which is the current limit of personal possession for medical uh, cannabis usage. Um, not necessarily because we thought that people would be carrying more around with them. And in fact, if you look at alcohol tobacco, there is virtually no limit on the amount of alcohol or tobacco that you could personally have for personal usage. The feeling was among the, our law enforcement colleagues that people with lots of cannabis would inevitably be selling it on the black market. On the other hand, if you've priced it right, you're not going to be able to sell it for under what the black market you're not going to be able to make a profit if you buy lots of it and then sell it for more money. You're going to be losing money. But people may be using it in, in large quantities to sell across the border. Once it becomes legal in Canada, unless it's legal in New York State or Massachusetts, there will be a market um, uh, and for, for illicit grow, growth. Um, we also wanted to limit, recommend limitations on where cannabis can be sold. Um, and at a broader level, we recommended that production and processing, so growth and then what you do with the product, should be federally regulated, uh, like a tobacco act is, but that where the products are distributed and sold should be left to the provinces and municipalities to decide. But we would recommend that there be limits on the number of, of, of sites that could be sold, how they could be licensed, where they could be with restrictions from right, uh, proximities to school or parks, etc. Somewhat like Vancouver is currently regulating illegal dispensaries, which I guess have fallen into the area of de facto decriminalization. Looking at some of the other things, the production model, I've talked about that. We recommended a regu federally regulated, standardized, licensed production model. We also recommended that it not be restricted to very large organizations, uh, very large operations, but that there should be room for, if you like, the equivalent of craft breweries or, or, or craft production facilities. We also recognized that the economies of some provinces, uh, particularly British Columbia, 
there are numerous small production facilities which have probably been operating for decades now and that some rural communities are really dependent on that economic activity. So we wanted to create, to recommend creating a schema that would allow places like Nelson to be able to get into the market in a regulated, approved uh, uh, fashion. We also think that that should employ good production practices. We visited some licensed growers in Washington State and if you compare them with licensed growers in Nanaimo, like Tilray, it's like looking at, um, I don't know, an arts and craftsy kind of greenhouse structure uh, like Mr. Van der Zan had versus a pharmaceutical operation. So we really think that we need to look at the, the more pharmaceutical, higher level standards for production. Um, you could have had rats and birds flying in and out of the facility I visited in Washington. So good production practices would be really important for a good quality uh, product. I've talked about product packaging and labeling. Am I running out of time? Well, I'm just going to uh, find out that we do want to have time for the question right. and answer. Okay. And uh, this is fascinating. Uh, but it's time to uh, conclude. Do so I do that it that okay. Can have the Thank, Thank you, Joyce. I appreciate that. So we also recommended that any regulatory framework can be um, flexible, have the ability to be flexible. We would limit criminal, we recommend limiting criminal prosecution for people who are growing uh, outside for, for trafficking across the border or trafficking to kids. Otherwise, we'd recommend non-criminal sanctions for people who are breaking the law. And we also recommended that any taxation should go to education, that there should be lots of discussion before the act was tabled and that we monies and profits from this should be going to education and treatment. The other piece that you'll probably want to ask me questions about is driving while impaired, but I won't talk about that. I'll wait till you ask me the questions. Thank you. Can, can I ask if people wouldn't mind coming over here to, to uh, line up and answer questions just because it's a big room? 